Hello, everyone. My name is Patrick Wheeler, and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Digital Strategies here at Tuck. And I'm excited today to welcome Sandeep Dadlani from Mars Incorporated to join us for a conversation. Uh, it should be a really great conversation. Um, as an introduction, Sandeep um, is currently the Chief Digital Officer at Mars. He is that company's first Chief Digital Officer and responsible for working with all of their global business segments to dr drive their digital transformation agenda. Um, prior to joining Mars Incorporated, he was one of the senior most leaders at Infosys, uh, one of the largest sort of technology advisory firms in the world, uh, responsible for their, their manufacturing, retail, CPG, and logistics practices. Um, he has an incredibly impressive career, focused on a lot of technology, AI, machine learning. He's run their incubator at Infosys as well. Um, and, and going all the way back to prior to emphasis working at Citibank. So a really robust career. We're excited to have him here to talk about their digital transformation journey. Sandeep, welcome. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you everyone for, um, you know, hanging with me today. Um, first of all, congratulations. You guys are uh, part of this uh, amazing school, an Ivy League school and, and, and this community is uh, clearly very privileged. Uh, and in times like this, uh, it's awesome to be sharing thoughts with you and, and seeking your feedback. I thought what we'll do is talk to you about some of the failures, learning, successes through our, what we call digital transformation. Um, and perhaps hope to, that you gain something from some of our experiences. So Mars, uh, first of all, as an intro, is a $40 billion enterprise in many businesses. It has got pet care as a primary business, chocolate confectionery, it's, you know, some of our brands that you've probably grown up with, like m and Snickers, et cetera, and then food. Um, and as we think about these different businesses, what binds us together is this unique culture. It's family owned, it's private. Um, and we work off specific principles inside the enterprise. Actually, a video does good justice to what Mars does and how we think about the world. So what I'll request Joe is to queue up that opening video. Please watch. Thank you, Joe. The world we want tomorrow starts with how we do business today. That's our purpose statement at a, at a company level. Now, each business segment has specific purpose statements. For example, our pet care business is passionately trying to drive a better world for pets. The Mars Wrigley chocolate confectionery business is building better moments where we have more smiles. So you see the linkage here. Every business has a purpose and the overall corporation has this purpose. So what could go wrong? In 2017, when I joined Mars, they really wanted to make a statement around digital transformation, except we were struggling on how to define it. So I spent the first hundred days 
traveling around the company, meeting salespeople, customers, factory workers, brand managers, vets in the hospitals and so on. And I came to a pretty interesting conclusion. You see in large companies, even successful large companies, the one thing that's lost is speed and agility. As in they're smart people who probably get all the digital we want them to get. There's some natively digital people. They're AI engineers hidden somewhere if you look hard enough. But somehow large companies lose their speed, their hustle, their fire to get something done at scale. And so we labeled, cue to the next slide, Joe, our digital transformation as simply 100x. And so we were not trying to make Mars get into digital businesses. Well, maybe yes, but that wasn't the point. The point was we are saying all of us at Mars, all 125,000 now, can just go 100 times faster when we go digital. That's it. That's our, that's our digital transformation motto, 100x. Not 10% more, but 100 times faster. Move to the next slide, Joe. Immediately, as we framed this 100x vision, there are concerns. You see, you are probably part of a large enterprise right now. You will go into a large enterprise soon and you'll be the transformation agent, the change agent, the leader. And you'll see it clearly as to what's to be done. But how do you win the hearts and minds of hundreds of thousands of people? What would you say? Would be Vox Clementis in deserto? Will you be the voice in the wilderness? Or will you then figure out a way to then make that voice count? So all we did was we tried to bring digital to life for each associate. You could be a warehouse forklift operator in Tokyo for Mars. You need to make sure that you understand digital. So we said, whoever you are, a truck driver in Australia, a brand manager in Chicago, a vet assistant in, in Oregon, when you put on your digital armor, you'll become a superhero. You'll become like Iron Man or Miss Red Hair, one of our favorite characters uh, being a brand company. We love playing around with brands. You will be a superhero. You'll be able to go 100 times faster. The next question was, well, how do I wear my digital armor? And so we we strived into defining what we now call our digital engine. The emphasis here is to keep things simple because the more gobbledygook we insert in this digital language, the more we alienate thousands of associates. Next slide, please, Joe. And so we framed this digital engine. And if you're following along so far, all we said is to go digital, you've got to do three things, three simple things. Nope, you don't have to learn advanced AI and learn neural networks and how to sort of pull things together in convolutional neural networks. No, you just have to find the problem, whatever problem you're solving for in context of your job, closest to the consumer, closest to the end user, using design thinking or whatever technique you might choose, but get really, really close to the end user. Then you solve the problem because you've framed the problem now very differently from the eyes of a consumer. You solve it using analytics, data, AI, technology, perhaps with things you've learned yourself or with expert teams. And more importantly, if you, once you solve them so that they're not just shiny objects manifesting themselves. Every company has lots of shiny case studies. You scale the solution using automation so that you and I, we were always built to find the next problem. And as you and I worry about our jobs, our careers, all we need to really do is to keep finding the next problem because when we frame problems with consumers, we are infinitely relevant. When we work with end users and find and frame the next problem cleverly, we are infinitely relevant because there are two big secrets in large corporations. One, 
and I hope you admit it as well, nobody really talks to customers and consumers. I let that sink in. Think about the company you're with. And I want you to think of people who actually physically, viscerally, not through cool digital tools or agencies that give you reports once in three months, who actually talks to customers and consumers every day? Everybody should. And the second interesting thing is, most of us are solving for the wrong problems. Let me give you examples. Let's go to the next slide. Let's go to the first step of this digital engine, user centricity, of finding the problems with user centricity. I remember the first few meetings where we brought in a lot of folks in a big consulting firm to frame this massive problem up there. How do we create an end-to-end -end connected, delightful, omni-channel consumer experience? And of course, the consulting firm laid out a five-year plan. Very experienced brand managers showed how the brand relevance and royalty will change once we start new programs on e-commerce, on direct-to-consumer, how we should invest in technology to change everything. And then midway through, we brought in consumers into the center of the room and we asked them, Miss, how do you think we can create a new delightful omni-channel end-to-end consumer experience? And she said, and I remember her words, what bullshit are you talking about? The PayPal button on your website doesn't work. The last time I ordered this brand, the bags came chipped in the end. There is a moment we go through in a design thinking exercise of extreme humiliation, of embarrassment, where the most experienced senior people in the room reflect on their 20, 30 years of glorious experience. And then after reflection, anger, denial, whatever phases you wanna go through, we start solving for the real problem. The real problem was to get the PayPal button fixed, not over five years, but ideally today. Or, or maybe tomorrow, but within days. And to get the chips, chipped bags problem solved within four weeks. And then to invite consumers and help frame the next problem. One of our divisions is a pet X-ray diagnostic division. We analyze more than 30 million dog X-rays in a year. We have a finite number of radiologists Pet radiologists are very rare to find. We employ most of them. And the challenge was they just didn't have enough bandwidth for the number of x-rays that had to be analyzed. We could sit in a conference room and frame, we need to train more radiologists. We need to hire more radiologists. We need to reduce the intake of x-rays. We should have vets stop sending dog x-rays to our diagnostic division. We could frame the problem any which way we want. So we send a couple of design thinkers to watch the radiologists, just watch them and really watch them over their shoulders, creepily, like really no social distancing. This was before COVID. So creepily watch the radiologists as they go about their work. And we found that a radiologist, an average one, spends about the first 60 seconds orienting the X-ray right. That's it, not rocket science. 60 seconds in orienting the x-ray right, just getting the top to the top and the bottom to the, to the bottom. And we said, well, I mean, we could save 60 seconds, but what's the value of that? Over 30 million x-rays. So we wrote a simple AI program that could orient the x-rays right. And we saved 60 seconds per x-ray, 30 million x-rays, you do the math. But then we had finished that first print in four weeks. We then watched that the radiologist was beginning to take some time, the next 10 minutes, in isolating problem areas in the x-ray. Another three sprints, some failures. We, we had, we nailed it. Now the computer could identify the problem areas in the x-ray. The next sprint was the radiologist started taking blood samples and other samples and cellular samples and counting the mitotic frequency. This count, if it goes beyond a particular number, detects cancer. 
And how do they do it? They count mitotic cells. The next print clearly indicated which, which X-rays and which blood samples were likely cancer candidates. The sprints go on. The radiologists keep getting freed up. The radiologists love their new system. Remember, the system will never do the ultimate diagnosis. That's the radiologist's job. But the shortage problem was solved by getting really, 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 really close to the end user. 20,000 Martians are today trained in design thinking, in user centricity, and in just framing the problem right. So in the first two years, we framed about a thousand problems. We didn't solve all of them. Actually, half of them went nowhere. And that is okay. We were just enabling Mars with a new superpower. Go to the next problem. Next slide, please. Sorry, problem. Now, the challenge of framing the problem in the way we did with the radiologists is that solving it used analytics. So we had to get to GitHub and open source and use a lot of data and in, ingest x-rays into our data lakes. And so we needed that infrastructure. And Mars, at least three years back, didn't have the most modern of infrastructures. So at the back end, we've set up a, an open source data lake. Actually, it's Azure, but it's you know kid gloves, open source and kid gloves. We hired 100 plus data scientists, some actually unlocked from within Mars. We, we never knew we had them. We had more than a thousand sprints. And now today we have more than 30,000 Mars associates across functions trained on basic data visualization, reporting and things like that. And about 200 plus AI projects at scale not the shiny case studies. In fact, if you go to marsaifestival.com, it's a public website, you'll see how we celebrated all those 200 projects in December, along with Satya Nadella and Andrew Ng and you know, all the luminaries that are there. They all converged in a week of festivities on celebrating 200 AI projects to scale. So this is how we are upskilling everyone. Go to the next slide. And to prove that point, we had an, an important external consulting firm come in and benchmark us against the average CPG firm. So in 2017, our analytics quotient, think about your way of measuring the analytics quotient of a firm. This consulting firm had 12 parameters. Um, to Don's question, how is Mars measuring the ROI on 100X? Various ways, Don, but but this is one leading indicator that our analytics quotient has gone from 10 to 33 to 40. And we continue our journey. Still a long way to go, but that's how we're at least racing ahead of the CPG peers. Go to the next slide. And once you've solved the problem, scaling it through automation is important. In that X-ray example, now we have about 10 different servers across all our diagnostic units, deploying that AI at scale for every X-ray, every blood sample that comes in. There are overall about 200 bots at scale, which have saved us more than 300,000 hours uh, across Mars. And every week, a new bot gets employed. During COVID, and COVID's been a big teacher and accelerator, we found strange uses. We found in our pet nutrition division, there used to be a person who whenever a customer gets a short order, as in doesn't get all the items that the customer ordered for, there was a person who used to go into our deep ERP systems to understand why the order was cut. And then really understand how those orders were classified. And then come back and inform the customer, this is why you didn't get the item you ordered for. That's done by a bot today because the volumes went so high during COVID on pet, pet nutrition. Everyone wanted to feed their dogs and cats and, and, and you know adopt more pets and so on and so forth. It was good for business, but we couldn't handle it, not with social distancing. These bots need no social distancing and they work over time and they do all the menial work that you and I were never meant to do. So that completes the digital engine. Move to the next slide. So really, You'll see examples like this from many companies, but the real power is, if you move to the next slide, Joe, is deploying the speed at scale. 
And if this engine is you know, whirring away across every part of the business, that's your digital transformation in a sense. The problems will be different. They'll be in supply chain, they'll be in R&D, but this is all there is to it. And I'm gonna show you some examples that came to life, particularly in COVID. And now some of these are easy because they're marketing examples. So you'll see a lot of them in advertising and campaigns. But one of the first things we did was really think about deploying direct to consumer campaigns to help out our frontline workers. So I want to go to the next slide, Joe. This is an example that took exactly eight days to launch, which is allow consumers, particularly in the Northeast of the US, to give an essential worker a free Snickers bar as a token of thanks. And since end to end, we found the problem, we spoke to frontline workers, they love a Snickers at the time they were going through hell and, and you know exactly what they were going through. And we allowed consumers to participate, big success. The numbers were staggering. And so we expanded the campaign to, next slide please. To now send a big box where we would match the box to a frontline worker. Snickers is a great loved brand. And so even our advertising now changed, normally campaigns and ads take months to really figure out but immediately we launched a, a Snickers campaign that was relevant for its time. Can you go to the next slide and play the video, please? It's so good to see you guys. Han, out here. Are we on yet? Oh. I thought we were doing a Zoom thing. Confused? No. Maybe you just need a Snickers. So the ad copy and the speed at which we were getting our campaigns out started changing as well. The next issue was pet adoption was on a high, but we really wanted to figure out how would potential pet owners visit shelters. They were not feeling safe visiting shelters during COVID. And so we enabled pet adoption on Zoom. If you go to the next slide. Play the video. It's on the slide. And so you see uh, this division, pedigree in particular and pet nutrition overall showed record growth uh, across, across the whole, whole story. And then finally, if you go to the next slide, I want to show you something that happened during Halloween. We have, con we have teams talking to consumers physically every week as part of user centricity. And some of the consumers in July or August were wondering how will they celebrate Halloween through COVID? You see, knocking on people's doors, trick or treating is a family tradition like no other. And so we, thought of this wild idea of creating a digital platform that was completely gamified within eight weeks and making a nationwide launch and perhaps a global launch. What emerged was Street Town, where you and I could decorate our doors on the app. You and I could trick or treat each other. And frankly, I could tr trick or treat my uncle in Florida or my grandma in Alaska. Now suddenly distance and geography became irrelevant. Also redemption could be through our retail partners or direct to consumer. Partnerships with Disney brought, you know, legends like the haunted house to life and many other fun experiences. At the end of it, it was a crazy sprint, lots of night outs, but at a speed that has never been done before. The result was a marketing campaign that has got more impressions than anything we've done in the past with this category. And frankly, a platform that can be used for every festival in the future. We are now thinking, why didn't we think of this before? Please watch the video. At Mars, we believe the world we want tomorrow starts with how we do business today. And the Halloween of tomorrow starts with a world we'll unveil this fall. Introducing Treat Town. More tricks more treats more households than ever before 
Treat Town will transform trick-or-treating into an interactive, inclusive, and child-safe month-long community experience. Drive adoption, conversion, and sales from ours and our retailers. And create a dynamic platform to support future holidays, partnerships, and global expansion. Welcome to the ultimate Halloween adventure. Street Town got billions of organic impressions for us and frankly unlocked new business models for all of Mars. Um, and the point is this, the intensity, the pace of the organization in transforming to digital has never been higher. COVID has helped and this whole digital engine has helped. Eventually, it was all about this human hustle, the idea that every human in Mars, whether they call themselves digital or not originally, could create a hustle, a fire that could go, help them go and help us all go 100x. So the next slide. And that's it. So um, I just wanted to pause here and ask you and your, you know, in the organizations you belong to and check with you whether you're ready to go 100x now. The next slide, we end this and we get into Q&A. Um, thank you. And Patrick. Um, yeah. Tell us uh, what you think and, and tell us what your audience thinks. Yeah, you know, I think it's it's remarkable to look at the transformation that's happened in a relatively short period of time. You've been just a few years now with Mars. That's a major shift. And, and what, what we've typically seen is two things, right? One is talent becomes a hard thing to manage and to transform, right? The people, changing people, changing process, changing the way of, viewing the world becomes really difficult. And then the second part of that is getting those experiments into production is usually really hard. You've managed to do both. And I'm, I'm curious, first of all, what's the secret? What, you know, what, what can you, you know, how can you help other people understand that? Because, you know, what looks as though it's a, you know, something that has been really easy can't it couldn't have been easy for you, right? And that journey for most organizations takes years and years and years and many fail. I mean, many organizations, whether it's digital transformations or in particular when AI is involved and analytics are involved, really struggle with those types of transformations. So, you know, how did you go about doing that? What have you learned along the way? Um, Patrick, the biggest learning, and this is only out of multiple failures. Uh, luckily they were in consulting. So, so we could apply these failures now in, your, in our own company. Um, was that senior management in conference rooms struggle to really find the real problems and frame the real problems. Um, we want, the CXOs want a pretense of control, but real problems are found and framed really on the ground with consumers, with associates in the factory line, with radiologists in the diagnostic labs and so on. And if we permit and empower teams, and frankly, if you're driving a movement in the organization, start looking on the ground for problems and start solving them before asking anybody, before aligning, before creating three committees to prioritize those problems, you do create a groundswell of energy that is important to unleash a successful transformation. That groundswell here manifested in 17,000 people being trained in user centricity we didn't mandate that training. It was a pull. In fact, I remember a Friday call we set up saying, where did you F up this week? <laughs> and the number of people who joined that call was remarkable because everybody said, wow, that's interesting because I did mess up this week and I can talk about it on this call. That's interesting. So the groundswell of energy was important. And then of course, once it was getting dangerous, we take the entire senior leadership, sit them down and, and see how we can channel the energy better. But unlocking the energy, the force, 
was important. Most companies I've been consulting with feel that the force is unlocked from the top and the top knows what to do. Secret between us, the top's clueless. The top needs guidance on how to align the force, the energy, and that's all there is to it. There's more to it than that, but that's like really the big summary of this story. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really good lesson, right? We, we hear a lot about customer centricity and know your customer. And I think the means to which that is often in the digital world is look at data, right? It's typically look at the data and what does the data tell you and how does that play out? But I think your example has been the examples that you were able to give in the presentation as well, in particular the radiological example, I think really gets to the heart of, no, 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 really go out into the real world. And the, you know, at the end, digital is a means, it's a tool, right? And so how do you solve those problems? How do you, you know, given that, how do you balance problem solving, which can be very tactical with strategic impact in, within the organization, um, you know, is there sort of a long-term plan to prioritize dif different units or different areas, or, or is this much more a start small, start to build the business case, you know, for, for doing more of this? It's probably more of the latter. Mm -hmm. um, for example, one of our early sprints, one of our data scientists was fascinated with was how we run pricing and promotions on certain products. And he had a simple philosophy. He had walked around in the stores and found a product on sale on a Friday with one promotion and then on a Saturday with another promotion. And he said, what sense does it make to run two back-to-back -back promotions? You created some artificial lift in demand from the first promotion. So he went back, he took all the sales data, he did some analysis and he came back with a simple hypothesis. This is a tech guy. This is a geek who only understands gobbledygook. And he said, look, from my weekend trip to the store and the data analysis I've done, you should not run two promotions back to back mm -hmm. because here's elasticity, here's demand, and here's all the beautiful mathematical models with it. What we did was highlight this insight to everybody top to bottom. It, instead of aligning with one layer, massaging the message, aligning with the next layer, massaging the message, by the time it reaches the top, it's so you know, cleaned up that it is less powerful. We shared this along this, the next thing, after some anger and some, some violent movements, we have strategic revenue management as a top-down strategic initiative with funding, with leadership, with governance, and that data scientist is the god of it. He really runs the whole show now because he found the first insight. But the first insight, the first energy force came from the bottom, then creating top-down strategic priorities has become important. Right now we have 14 top-down strategic transformation programs. One of them is strategic revenue management I just talked about. There are many others, but they've all been, not everybody will admit this, but they've all been discovered bottoms up with excitement and then become top-down. And that's how we found more success than others. I mean, it, it's a, that's a that's a pretty strong culture, right? Like that that's a culture of of real ownership at the, across the business. And is that something that, you know, how do you reinforce that? As your because you know, as we talked about, so much of transformation is about people. How do you reinforce that? How does Mars generally reinforce that? Is is that a good fortune to have that as a as a a typical ethic that predates you? And 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 how do you then look, capture that and really drive that? You've mentioned a couple examples, but um, the Mars is a family owned business and a founder owned business, which means that there is a little bit of that founder mentality. When it's your own business, you sort of think slightly differently about it. And the culture is governed by five important principles, um, which are more than just sort of things on the board. It's quality, responsibility, efficiency, um, freedom. And those kind of principles are used for decision-making every every day, having said that, digital just unlocks the entrepreneurship aspect of it, at least the, the way we've defined digital, saying, go talk to consumers. You could be the accountant in the legal counsel part of our treasury department. It is your business to talk to consumers and come back 
with a different problem to solve for, or talk to factory associates, or talk to somebody on the line, or talk to accountants for that matter, who are also finding problems. I think that unlocks a level of entrepreneurship um, and responsibility like no others. And it is a human culture. We hug each other. Well, not, not in these times, obviously, but we do hug each other. We do feel for each other. So there is a humanness around the culture, which we enjoy and are proud of. Um, it can get a bit chaotic at times with that kind of a culture, but it's ideal for driving a chaotic grounds up digital transformation, it's fertile ground in that sense. Yeah, uh, on, that, on that line, you know, we had a question from one of our fellows here in the center, Emma, um, around accelerating customer listening to 100X and, and kind of how much she really likes that idea and, and, and that speed. But how do you build, you know, does building engaged digital communities play a role in that customer listening? And, and then how do you kind of go about doing that? You mentioned some in-person things, but how do you build the, on the digital side? We started this, Emma, with seven associates. These were 20-something associates uh, in terms of age. Um, they were New York and London based. They were right-brained. They had no technical knowledge. We called this the user centricity group. And all this user centricity group did was just meet consumers. And they were not meeting consumers with, oh, what do you think of the Snickers brand? They were just meeting consumers and asking, how do you live? What do you eat? Where do you shop? And just deeply intrinsically understanding consumers and unlocking insights. This then became a movement through uh, those weekend calls we talked about. Where, do you, where did you mess up this week on, on, on Friday? or coaching sessions. Think of this as therapy effectively for the enterprise. And lo and behold, they also created a franchise of user-centricity clubs. So different groups started cropping up with user-centricity clubs locally in Nashville, in Oregon, in London, in China, in Guangzhou and so on. And as the movement went forward, we created certification. So if you have done a design thinking course uh, and solved a problem in context, well, then you are a, a champion and, and then you could become an expert and so on and so forth. 17,000 associates later, honestly, we've stopped counting. It doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter if we now go and say, oh, we moved from 17,000 to 19,000. What we see is everyone's coming back, framing their problems. Hey, even our annual award ceremony are now the application form says, put your problem statement as how might we, which is classic design thinking language, how might we, so, so the, the lingo of the company, and it's covered in, in HBR as well, um, how a, a, an entire cultural transformation could take place. So it's been organic, but we've also made it a lot of fun. So the weekend mm -hmm. report for this core group is a dancing TikTok video. It's not <laughs> an Excel sheet. And what this group in particular realizes is we are appealing to the right brain and the hearts of people. And we might pretend to know our projects and our plans and our milestones, and we might pretend to be serious all week, but guess what? We go home and cry and we laugh and we dance. And I know you're trying to predict what milestone you hit next year. You're barely going to make it to this weekend and you know it. And that part, unlocking the human part of our story is perhaps as important as any in a, in a digital transformation. Absolutely, it, it's that, that deep empathy as part of one of the core components of design thinking has become so important in solving so many problems. And I think that aligns pretty well with agile methodology as well and learning from what's happening in the world and incorporating that back in. You know, I know that you've gone through that agile kind of transformation at Mars as well. So. You know, it seems to be a very, very strong kind of indication of, of things that we've seen as well. And we've taught here, whether that be agile or design thinking through the center. Um, there's a, there's a, good, a good question around your role and the difference between say a CIO, a date, chief data officer, business intelligence, chief digital officer. Can you talk a little bit about your role and sort of what that means and, and is it in, tandem with a CIO, for example, at Mars and, and sort of how do you kind of think about that, that, that differentiation? I think the, so I replaced a CIO um, and Mars wanted a CDO because they wanted a digital transformation. But 
guess what? Between us, nobody really knows what they were trying to do. They were trying to drive transformation and change. That was clear. The fact that technology played a role in it, that was clear as well. The fact that a large technology team at scale reporting into you helps you then drive momentum and the fact that you have systems around you, you have access to data and things are flowing through you and, and, and you do have a budget, those things certainly help. After that, your job, and you probably all know this, is what you make of it. So we've framed it in such a way that technology is just an excuse, sometimes a bad one, to drive that change and transformation. In fact, we framed very early that we want all of Mars to be digital, not just the tech group, not just the digital department, not just the e-commerce department, but all of Mars. So what we do now is we've created this idea and, and my, my friend Jason Ripper in, in, in Mars, his friend Mark Schulte is, is, is on as well. And he's asked the same question saying, are you in fact the in-house consulting firm? No, we are not going to create a digital department that everybody else in Mars goes, oh, well, those guys are digital. I, I just come at nine and leave at five. But you know, for digital, those guys, we want each one in Mars to be the digital department of Mars. And so we form capabilities and federate them, empower them with every part of Mars. So for example, in the re strategic revenue management promotions example I gave you, we formed a part of data scientists and we've moved them into the sales teams. Guess what? If you're closer to the problem, you're gonna be more dangerous with solving it, not in the center. So form and federate is our motto in driving this transformation. And I don't care what the title says anymore. We're just driving this change at 100X. Mm -hmm. So Chief Digital Officer sounds sexy right now, but if you give me a sexier title, I'll take it. I mean, it's, it's, it, it makes a lot of sense. And I think sometimes even just a change in title and role can help sig provide that signal to organizations, right? Um, along those lines and, and thinking about the digital as being pushed out as well as a, an IT organization that's still very much there, there is a lot of technology that underpins this. How much of it are you building? How much of it are you using third parties? How much are you, you know, leveraging other, other partners um, in some of this journey? We've unlocked the entire technology hairball. Any enterprise has a technology hairball. Some people call it ERP, some people call it whatever they want to, into different layers. There's infrastructure, there is um, process orchestration, there is uh, experiences, there is data and analytics. And we've said it's clear to us that certain things in technology will change over 10 years while certain things will change every week. And we've created a vendor ecosystem designed around that. But by uncoupling or decoupling the layers, we can change experiences every week. We can change data and analytics and federate them out to everybody else, but hold the infrastructure centrally with security, with compliance, with processes and controls and so on and so forth. To that point, um, we do use a vendor ecosystem, which is in three tiers. Tier one is some of the large partners who allow us to drive scale, the Microsofts of the world that we are public with, or the SAPs of the world, or the Accentures, the Infosys, the Cognizance of the world, the Deloitte's of the world. Then we have a tier two partner that are mid-sized companies that can work in four week sprints faster than the others. Uh, these are typically analytics and design firms, uh, the Fractals, the Mu Sigmas, the IDEOs of the world, and so on. And then there's a tier three of, of really cool but deep niche AI startups with whom we will solve one problem, but we'll keep them tight and keep solving that one problem deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, for example, right now we do a lot of commodity price forecasting, media investment forecasting through some specific startups um, that we hold close to our chest because we feel that's very, very powerful. So that's the vendor ecosystem we used. In general, I'd say we about 40% in-source, 60% outsourced. That number is irrelevant as far as you're framing the right problems, that's all. Mm -hmm. it, that's a good segue to another question that Emma has asked. Um, she's currently taking design thinking, which is taught through the center with our 
our faculty director, Alva, Professor Alva Taylor is a, uh, you know, the professor here at Tuck that teaches design thinking. And she says, you know, now that I'm taking that class, she's realizing how hard it is to do good problem framing. Um, you know, and her question is around, how do you encourage people to spend time on problem framing versus jumping to solutions? And, you know, framing the problem in ways that suggest a specific, or, you know, framing the problem in a way that suggests the solution, but actually really getting that good because, you know, it is a very difficult skill to, to develop and you, I'd love to hear more about that. Am I, 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 I feel you, it's tough. Uh, I've, I went through my first design thinking training in I think in D school at Stanford. Um, IDEO taught me once. I still don't get it. And it's, it's really after hundreds of design thinking workshops, it is a muscle that you have to train constantly. And, but the good news is you can practice anywhere and everywhere. You can practice with your spouse. Oh, gosh, try and practice it with your spouse <laughs> or with your, with your kids. Um, really important, try not looking at your phone and listening to your kids for 10 minutes. And, you know, it is unraveling. But if you do practice it, and if you do train that muscle, um, it unlocks superpowers in, in everything that you do. Uh, and if you start framing problems this way, I can tell you it'll be worth it. So uh, it's tough, but please, please, uh, practice hard and keep getting refresher trainings from the right people. Um, don't make it too complicated as a technique itself. Um, keep things simple, but practice every day. It's a good answer. I, you know, it's it's an important kind of skill to kind of repeat, as you mentioned, repeatedly refine, and um, that's that's a great advice. How do you, so, uh, you know, shifting gears a little, how do you overcome the inertia? There's a question around, how do you overcome the inertia um, in empowering people to be their own sort of digital owners and, and on their own, but then not getting that feedback of, okay, yet one more thing to, to, to learn and to do and, and, and kind of that, that duality of that. How do you, how do you kind of balance that with? You with have to have an irrational belief in people mm -hmm. that everybody, um, you could be talking to, you know, Jack Smith, who's been 40 years in the business, who sits in a corner, who comes to the office, who goes out, who's waiting for retirement next year. Jack has unlimited potential. Now you have to believe in Jack. And if you do, then you realize that actually Jack's pretty interesting because sometime 20 years ago, he did do something very cool with a little bit of data analytics. Everybody had data analytics at some point or some Excel sheet uh, jugglery they did, or he or she was so close to consumers at some point in time. I'll give you an example. When we started this user centricity group, we had this uh, amazing design thinking expert. She's 27, she's very good at her work. We profiled her in the New York Times. We said, Laura, and Lauren, Lauren, actually her name's Lauren. You can go look up New York Times. Lauren's the perfect design thinking person. She listens to consumers. She's, she's infusing a new wave of user centricity in March. We got a mail, we got a letter, and I have it framed. It's from Marion Smith. And Marion Smith wrote a part protest, passive aggressive letter to us. She said, I'm 93. And I think you guys, are just generally blowing up design thinking as if it's a new thing and listening to consumers is a new thing. In the 1940s, I worked with Forrest Mars, original founder, and he used to run an M&M's line. And he used to tell me every day to go out and meet consumers, help them taste M&M's, come back. And we used to change things in the line for the M&M's to taste better and better and better. We used to do this 50 years ago. Why are you presenting this to me as, as a new thing? And that's my provocation. So Jack Smith has gone through all these techniques. You are not going to be the first one to be introducing them. These are human techniques more than digital techniques. You know, before we run out of time, one question that, that, that um, you know, I think we've asked everyone in the last year, how has the pandemic really transformed your 
your organization, your team, you know, your leadership style? Five of my associates in Brazil right now are infected. One of them just got released from hospital today. The level of empathy that me as a leader as well has developed and, and I see people around me, we really started caring for each other more. It's funny, we just see each other over 13 inch rectangular screens, but we care and we hug less, which is a big deal in Mars, but we care about each other much more than ever. And the second, we are faster than ever in getting things done. So more empathy and more speed, this recognition that we can be so resilient and yet more people have broken down on, on screen than ever before in the last one year. So we are so resilient and yet so fragile. Mm -hmm. This understanding for Mars, we think we've discovered and unlocked a new clock speed. So we would love to maintain this level of empathy and this level of clock speed as we move forward. And how are, how are you, I mean, that's a big challenge, right? And I think organizations all over the world are trying to balance this. Okay, what, are, what can we do to maintain some of the, the things that were positive about work from home and, and developing this empathetic kind of muscle to a new level, but also gain some of the advantages that we get from being in person? Like, how are you thinking about that future for your team? Um, iteratively, because we, we think, you know, we, we see a lot of statements out in the market that, oh, work will be remote in the future. Oh, work will be hybrid in the future. I don't know how work will be. Sure, it seems like some version of hybrid, but we have factories, we have wet hospitals, we have different kinds of people. So we've gone deep in classic tradition with associates asking them how they feel. And we are solving this in sprints because we see technology playing a role, whether it's holographic technology, where we, our holograms will be in a conference room together or whether it'll be part hybrid where five of us are at home with our pets and children all over us, while five of us are formally dressed in a conference room watching the other five, we don't know. But, but it's gonna create a set of iterations and we are interested in the iterations, not just the outcome because the outcome will come whenever it comes. Well, you know, I think we're just about out of time. This has been a really enjoyable uh, hour for me. Um, and, and I know from folks on the line as well that they've certainly taken great lessons away from this conversation. We, you know, on behalf of the center, our colleagues in our alumni office that have helped connect the alumni to this session as well. Um, and the school at Tuck here, you know, we just wanna thank you for spending, spending this time with us and look forward to future, future opportunities to, to uh, engage with you and, and the team there at Mars. I, I thank you for this opportunity. I apologize for starting a couple of minutes late to somebody who, who was not happy with it. It is all my fault, not Patrick's or Joe's fault. <laughs> but um, I would request you to, to be that voice in the wilderness, uh, to, to do well uh, by your school um, in driving change in your respective organizations and communities. And if you helping people go 100x can lead the way, then, then so be it. So more power to you and, and all the very best. Wonderful. Thank you again, Sandeep. And thanks to everyone that, that has joined us today. We really look forward to, to seeing you at future events. Um, and uh, you know, can't thank you enough. Everyone be healthy, be safe until we see you next time. <laughs>